We are hosting three panels over the course of today to touch upon the intersection of journalism, law, and digitization. Now, first, I would like to thank our principal sponsors, that is Barucha and Partners and Phoenix Legal, that have covered costs for today's event. Uh, some of you have also donated to attend this conference, and we are deeply grateful for your support. And I urge attendees to help support this kind of community funding. As News Laundry puts it best, I pay to keep the news free. And this principle of independence by individual Indian giving applies to nonprofits advocacy organizations like us as well. Let me step towards setting some context for impolite conversations. Uh, I'll start with uh, something I read in Josie Joseph's book, A Feast of Vultures, and he actually states it in the epilogue, the last few lines when he's talking about the country. He says that the long-term view about India is really far away. It's good, but it's really far away. In the long term, we would all be dead. And in the short term, too many Indians live without any hope in a crony capitalist state. This monopoly of the few over the resources and will of the state must end. Now, these are rather dim words to start a, con uh, to start a, uh, a conference, right? And, uh, but they pierce through, and as the truth often does. And it seems harsh, candid, even impolite. Now, if we look at the several democracy and press freedom rankings, India presents a shrinking civil, civic space and uh, there's constraints on funding. There's more uh, like uh, criminalization of investigative and critical journalism. And it would not be out of place to also say that there are certain regulatory measures which have been taken, such as the IT rules or even certain actions such as Pegasus on the phones of journalists, which almost seem to support these kind of quantitative exercises, but don't fully capture that context. Now, to provide this kind of insight, we are drawing on the expertise of a panel format by which we are placing one senior lawyer with one distinguished journalist. And we are hoping to build it out over these three uh, panel tracks that we have. It would not also be out of place to notice what's happening uh, just in the last week. While Siddiq Kapan has gotten bail after 705 days as an under trial, there's another case against him, I read. And some believe this offers hope. Some claim this offers only incomplete justice. I believe the reality is a little more complex, right? It goes beyond hope. For in this week itself, we have seen tax surveys or raids on several uh, established civil society organizations, on funding agencies, on essentially people who help us ask the right questions. And I believe these mixed signals demonstrate rather than hope, a fundamental belief by some people, by large constituencies of people in constitutional rights. For many, this is the freedom of speech, which today's conversations will be about. And this unites a lot of you today. So rather than just passively listening, as the room does fill up, and I hope it does towards the noon, um, I would hope that you also reach out to each other, uh, chat with old friends, but also explore some new collaborations which you can strike up. And given that I started with despair, let me end with some consolation. And this comes from the uh, uh, prologue to Vanita Kohli's classic, The India Media Business, which she's revised over the pandemic. And uh, this is what she says before she starts a survey of each media sector. So here we have a bloody-nosed, battered media and entertainment industry fighting both the pandemic and the regulators. What will we do? What will it do? What it has always done? Its job. With these words, I'd like to start the first panel by inviting Tanmay, who's a litigation counsel at the Internet Freedom Foundation. And if you find any of the conversations you're engaging or if your thoughts, you can always tweet out today by using the hashtag be impolite.